Similar to the retrospective prologue of the first game, the opening events of Tomb Raider 2 also take us back in time. On this occasion, we witness something that happened more than 2,000 years ago. The flashback cutscene shows a brutal battle between a royal army and a group of monks. Amidst the armed conflict, something much more dangerous and deadly stalks the battleground. A humongous, terrifying dragon annihilates the sparsely armed Buddhist monks. The dragon is the mutated first emperor of China, Qin Xiu Huang, who took on this appearance after stabbing himself with an incredibly powerful mystical blade. In his quest to unify all of China in the 3rd century BC, he used the power of the wondrous Dagger of Xi'an to turn himself into the dragon in order to smash his foes and strike fear into the hearts of the subjected people. However, the particular military campaign depicted in the cutscene does not turn out successfully for the Emperor. A wounded monk spots, and manages to remove, the blade from the dragon's stomach. This causes the Emperor to lose his mighty form and transmute into nothing but a pile of bones. Upon retrieving the mystical dagger, two monks make their way to what looks like the entrance to a temple in the middle of the night. Equipped only with torches, they arrive at a mysterious door that guards a room with a peculiar pedestal in its centre. One of the monks approaches it with the dagger in hand. As he returns it to its rightful resting place, he unleashes what appears to be a binding spell that traps him in the hall and shuts the door behind him. In 1997, roughly 2,200 years later, adventurer Lara Croft returns to this fateful site on her journey to acquire the legendary dagger of Xi'an. Presumably following someone else's lead to a secluded section of the Great Wall of China, she makes a grand entrance as she leaps out of the helicopter that brought her before it takes off and leaves Miss Croft to her treasure hunting business. 
Although the exact location is never specified in the game, it is plausible that this part of the wall was built upon the foundations of the original fortification that dates back to the time of the aforementioned first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang. His section of the wall was especially famous, as it was the first to connect all previously erected frontiers along the northern border of the empire. As the Great Wall of China has been rebuilt, repaired and redesigned many times up until the 18th century AD, most of what can be seen today is from the Ming Dynasty that was present from the 14th to the 17th century AD. The same applies to the section of wall that Lara reaches after climbing a rather steep cliffside to get to one of the old watchtowers on top of the fortification. She gains entrance to a hidden corridor inside of the wall and successfully avoids a number of old traps including blades, boulders, and deadly spikes. When she arrives at a ginormous, mossy chasm in the middle of the underground caverns beneath the Great Wall, she notices a convenient modern zip line that must have been constructed very recently. And, without hesitation, she decides to use it to cross the gorge. Having reached the other side, our adventurer finds what she was looking for, the entrance to the Temple of Xi'an. It is the same gateway the monks used two millennia ago to return the dagger to its resting place. Knowing that this is in fact the same locale we saw earlier helps us to specify just where exactly along the wall Lara is located. Parts of the Ming Dynasty era wall intersect with parts of the original wall, for instance, in the King Ling Mountains in the province of Shunzi, whose capital, Xi'an, is home to Qin Su Huang's tomb and the infamous Terracotta Army. If we assume that Qin Su Huang played such a drastic role in the history of the mythical dagger and that the artifact itself could be associated with him, it would only make sense that the Temple of Xi'an is located within reach of his burial site, or rather, the other way round, since both the temple and the blade are probably much older. Regarding the origin of the name, it is safe to assume that it is not related to the name of the Shunzi capital, Xi'an, as the city was only named Xi'an in the 14th century AD, which translates to Western Peace. Instead, the name more likely refers to the concept of immortality. In Taoism, Xi'an is a word for an enlightened person and best translates to terms like transcendent superhuman, celestial being, alchemist or wizard. These immortal saint-like shamans were often associated with the powers of a dragon. They were often depicted as riding dragons or being able to fly themselves. Before Lara can investigate the mysterious entrance door, she is ambushed by a bulky man in some sort of cultist attire. Pardon me, if that was just your way of trying the doors for me. <laughs> Leave that tummy gun on my earring. Though not anymore. So after you. Somehow, you don't behave like you got a monk's blood. I understand that somehow is in my favor, so indulge me about the dagger. I'd be indebted with your life. These doors are waiting for the right one, the right time to arrive, and then the dagger's blade will honor the hearts of those who believe. So unless you pledge your loyalty as well... And which one is that? To the sins and fortunes of Marco Bartoli. After hearing about the cultist's business with the dagger, she heads over to his makeshift camp. Here, she accesses his laptop and finds valuable information on his employer and his hideout in Italy. Aha, uh -huh. Gianni Bartelli. Via Caravelli, Venice. Not being able to open the giant gate to the Temple of Xi'an, Lara decides to track down the Italian sect and find out more about their business with the dagger.
Perhaps the most popular Italian tourist destination, Venice, with its hundreds of canals, bridges and old narrow roads and alleyways, offers a pleasant change to the rocky caverns in China. A noteworthy part of the history of the Mediterranean City of Water dates back to its development from a Byzantine-ruled city to an autonomous city-state between the 9th and the 12th century AD, during the course of which Venice became one of the most powerful mercantile hubs of its time. Today, apart from its iconic waterways, Venice is known for its historic charm, its romantic scenery, and its medieval and renaissance landmarks. These include the world-famous town square Piazza San Marco, the Doge's Palace, and, naturally, the five-kilometre-long Canal Grande. The run-down and shady abandoned canals of this rather more secluded quarter our adventurer finds herself in are much less visited and are supposedly home to the headquarters of the Bartoli family and their cult, known as Fiamma Nera, which translates to Black Flame. There is little information surrounding this mysterious organisation, as they have operated in the shadows for a long time. Their first noteworthy leader, who very likely founded the cult himself, was Gianni Bartoli, he was a popular Venetian magician who lived in the early 20th century and had a thing for ancient relics, preferably any Qin dynasty pieces. He soon became obsessed with the myth surrounding the Dagger of Xi'an and made it his life's quest to find the artifact and abuse its powers. Perhaps he sought for a way to improve his act as a magician or grew disillusional while his hunger for power and influence became fueled by his growing interest in China's early history. Whatever it was that made him initiate a mythical sect and enlist the services of henchmen with varying ranks and obligations, his efforts soon came to fruition. Gianni could call a family of loyal supporters and devotees his own. It's not surprising that Gianni's blood-related family, namely his only son Marco, was also inaugurated into the cult. Marco grew up honouring his father's traditions and was made familiar with the other members and their moral code from an early age. At one point in time, Gianni got his hands on the so-called Seraph, a very important ancient key that would help him get closer to his goal of finding the Dagger of Xi'an. However, on a voyage to Tibet, his luxury liner, the Maria Doria, sank in the Indian Ocean. The cult leader and many of his men died, and the priceless relic they carried on board was lost. After his father's death, Leadership over the Thiamanera was passed down to Marco Batoli. Since then, he worked hard to follow in Gianni's footsteps and ultimately to complete his obsessive quest to find the dagger so he could live up to his father's legacy. Making her way through these desolate parts of Venice, Lara arrives at the seemingly abandoned estate of the Bartoli family on Via Caravelli. She soon reaches a huge, but largely vacant, opera house. This cultural building was once used by Gianni Bartoli for his acts as a magician and illusionist, and was later used by his son, perhaps as a base of operations. Lara climbs through the fragile opera house and across the flooded orchestra pit to reach the backstage area. Here, the Fiamma Nera cultists seem to be preparing for a hasty departure. Ambushed by a massive, dual revolver-wielding henchman who might be in charge of the troop, our treasure hunter is forced to fight her way through the big storage area before she manages to leave the opera house through the back entrance. The convenient exit door is connected to a jetty where a Bartoli seaplane is parked. The plane is about to take off, newly loaded with cargo from the converted opera house turned base of operations. Whatever the cultist's destination is, it must be related to their quest of finding the dagger. Our adventurer quickly hops on board. It seems that she's hit the jackpot, as she overhears a conversation between two Italians from the cockpit. It becomes clear that it is Marco Batoli himself who is co-piloting the plane.
with me, but it's not quite the same now, is it? Someday you will get a speeding ticket for the ton, Fabio. Hey, it's just a gut feeling that um, maybe you are wrong to look there. Is your belief so fragile? Gut, Fabio. It's no more direction than a simple through and out. Honest. Greater than impulse. He possessed the seraph. But he was just a disciple in this design. His death, plotting a path to be sought by the one, his son. You understand? Lara sneaks up on the two of them. However, Marco catches her in the act, and another cultist by the name of Eros shows up behind her and knocks her unconscious. <laughs> Marco had been patiently seeking his father's final resting place and, more importantly, the seraph that sank with him and his luxury liner so many years ago. The Fiamma Nera keeps Lara alive and locks her up immediately after the plane arrives on a massive rig platform somewhere in the Indian Ocean. In their efforts to locate the deep sea grave, the cult has erected a rig right out on the ocean for digging, diving and salvaging operations that are even now in full swing. Lara awakens in a small storage room just outside of where the plane has been parked. She makes her way across the massive platform. It has seen better days, most likely because it was purchased second hand and erected in a rush after the Fiamma Nera located the shipwreck. Lara finally arrives in the diving area at the bottom of the rig, where a small submersible is ready to be boarded by Bartoli's divers. When she approaches the diving pit, she overhears a group of men violently interrogating somebody. Blood or answers? I have no preference. You should spill a bit of a bowl. <laughs> okay, Marco. Glad to have your heart. <laughs> What do you want? She enters the room, ambushes the cultists, and finds out who that somebody is. Oh, you are not one of them. But you are a monk. Brother Chen Bakeng. You have come for me. I saw bright lights around me. That was gunfire. I think it was them who got taken away by it. But you are my guide, my path beater to a next incarnation. I have done my time here, haven't I? What are you doing here? With Marco Bartoli. Nothing! I, I led righteous life, here for reasons rooted only in necessary evil, as my father was before me when he bombed Gianni's vessel deep into these waters. Now I'm here, uh, was here, to prevent his son from salvaging the Seraph. The Seraph? You not know my life's work well. You sure you're not here for them? Their Jackanory days are well over. They want the Seraph to unlock a malignant treasure we contain in our monastery in Tibet. Since being stolen by imbecile vagabonds centuries ago, we've been without key to it, relying solely on cleansing of our prayers to keep it subdued. Then the occultist Gianni B acquired it. Trouble we knew. He breathed life back into ancient belief, one not to be stopped by any amount of head bowing. And now again, it is here. Marco, infected with madness. He has violent mind, but not yet the power to satiate it. So, we reach for our weapons once more. The true detox of evil. Where can you be taking me? I thought this was my big break. Guess changes are for this rest. Oh, I need one.
Fiamma Nera struck gold. And it seems that Marco Bartoli has a nose for tracking down shipwrecks as the submarine draws closer to the wreck of the Maria Doria. No official location for the wreck is ever stated in-game, but there is plenty of room for speculation. The developers were inspired by real-life maritime accidents like the Titanic, but more importantly, the Italian ocean liner SS Andrea Doria. The Andrea Doria collided with another ship on its way to New York City in 1956. After 11 hours out on the ocean, where most passengers were evacuated, it sank the next morning off the coast of North America. Needless to say, the Andrea Doria does not only share part of its name, it also looks rather similar to the Maria Doria. In addition, both the Andrea Doria and the Maria Doria rest in a depth of roughly 240 feet, which is 40 fathoms deep. However, in the case of the Maria Doria, there is no reason to assume it crossed the Atlantic Ocean at all, since it was almost certainly heading for Tibet. Another possible and more plausible theory is that the Maria Doria sank in the Adriatic, in the Mediterranean Sea. Given that Gianni's journey on the luxury liner began in Venice, it would have had to have crossed the Adriatic Sea. However, it is very questionable, if not impossible, that the Barkang monks took the trouble to travel all the way from their isolated monastery in the Himalaya to the shores of the Balkans, or even Italy, when Gianni's destination was literally right on their doorstep. What is much more likely is that they attacked the ship closer to their home, perhaps when they felt threatened enough to take the initiative. Although the marine wildlife Lara encounters near and inside the wreck is not exclusively native to these domains, many species are still very common there. The Indian Ocean is home to various species of sharks, moray eels and barracuda, all of which Lara comes across on her dive. What she fends off with a harpoon gun could easily be a great white shark, or a bull shark, both of which inhabit the Indian Ocean. While the great white shark is more common in the temperate regions of the North Atlantic, the Mediterranean and the Eastern Pacific Ocean, the bull shark is a lot more common in the Indian Ocean. European species of both barracuda and moray eel inhabit the Mediterranean and the North Atlantic, as well as species that are exclusive to the Indian Ocean, namely the pick handle barracuda and the Indian mud moray eel. Ultimately, all evidence points to the wreck being located in the Indian Ocean. The luxury liner must have sailed from the Adriatic through the Suez Canal in Egypt. From there, the Maria Doria crossed the Indian Ocean and sailed around the Indian subcontinent, maybe up to the Bay of Bengal, specifically somewhere off the coast of India or Bangladesh, possibly near the Ganges Delta. How and when the Barkang monks got wind of the voyage and how they managed to track Gianni down remains a mystery. It is unclear how they managed to blow up and sink the vessel to these depths, and there are also doubts about how the ship arrived at the bottom of the ocean under these very peculiar circumstances. Lara first makes her way through the bottom part of the wreck in all its rusty and rotten glory. Storage areas have been decomposing badly for decades, and it can be difficult to keep one's bearings. After exploring a sizeable portion of the hull and reaching the living areas, Lara realises that most of the ship is resting on the seabed upside down. A large portion of the luxury liner is almost completely intact and still looks gorgeous as ever. It looks like time itself froze down here, and these sections of the ship could be towed to the surface and float again as if nothing ever happened. Some rooms are completely accessible and not flooded, although a wide array of vegetation and deep-sea fauna has spread across the wreck. The magnificent ballroom, an intact indoor swimming pool, and a room with a glass ceiling, all upside down, offer a stunning view 
and reflect the atmosphere of what this ship was once like. Our adventurer soon finds herself on the deck of the Maria Doria that has miraculously managed to not only remain intact, but also end up in a gigantic, cavernous air pocket. The ship must have broken in two upon being bombed, and on its way to the seabed, broke up into various additional parts when it crashed into the caves near the bottom. The Fiamanera must have drained the water, both in the underwater caves and parts of the wreck, and pumped down air from their rig platform in order to make their salvage operation more efficient. Maybe it's sheer luck, or maybe she's gifted with a superhuman sense of direction, but Lara eventually locates an isolated cabin near the ship's stern that not only contains an intact safe, but also the object of her desire, the Seraph. Yet again, it turns out that Marco's guesswork was right. His father had indeed possessed the golden key to Barkang Monastery and was in fact on his way to Tibet in order to rob the monks of the treasure they were so desperate to defend. The origins of the Seraph are a complete mystery. Best described in the Old Testament of the Bible and the Torah as heavenly beings or angels with six wings, seraphs or seraphim are also typically believed to be winged serpent-like creatures. The word seraph from the Hebrew saraf can be translated as fiery serpent or poisonous serpent. The seraphim are listed in the ancient Jewish book of Enoch as one of the angels of power who never sleep and who are closest to the throne of God. Part of the highest choir of the angelic hierarchy in Christianity and being on the fifth of 10 ranks of angels in Judaism, according to medieval theology and philosophy, the seraphim play an important role in Abrahamic religions. The narrow body of the key itself could very well be interpreted as the slim body of a snake. This would correlate with the serpent part of the myth. While there is no direct Buddhist equivalent to the angels of Christian and Jewish mythology, there is a group of celestial beings named Devas. A Deva is in many ways superior to a human being in terms of power and longevity, although it is neither immortal nor morally perfect. Devas also exist in Hinduism, where they are viewed as something much closer to the concept of angels as seen in other religions. However, it is highly unlikely that the Seraph is meant to represent a Deva, considering that there are few to no depictions of these beings as having wings. The one Hindu-Buddhist creature that perhaps comes closest to what the Seraph looks like is the so-called Garuda, a mythical, sometimes humanoid bird. A Thai Buddhist adaptation of this bird deity is shown on a wall decoration at Wa Prake Temple in Bangkok, where the creature battles its arch enemies, the Naga, a race of powerful serpents. The way this Garuda is depicted, as holding both ends of a snake in its arms, may very well have caused confusion to whoever it was first stole the Seraph from Barkang Monastery. This depiction is almost identical to the Seraph, and the simple-minded vagabonds might not have been familiar with the local mythology and mistook it for something that was popular in their own religion. The tale of the biblical seraphim and their serpent-like winged appearance is probably what resulted in this golden key being incorrectly referred to as the seraph. What is also rather interesting is the seraph's strong resemblance to the so-called Eye of the Buddha. This symbol is often found in the form of paintings in stupas, a type of Buddhist shrine. These eyes are also found in great numbers at Barkang Monastery, painted on doors, walls and pillars. Each pair of eyes has a curly shape in place of a nose. This might represent the Nepalese numeral one, which stands for unity and is meant to symbolize that there is only one way to gain enlightenment. When we compare this symbol to the seraph, it is easy to notice that the curly, snout-like numeral is similar to the shape of the key's body, while the prominent eyes and brow form the key's wings, and the Buddha's third eye in the center 
looks very much like the key's head. However, a closer look at Barkang Monastery, which we will look at in more detail shortly, will reveal that this might simply be another coincidence, because there are other, less misleading depictions of the Seraph to be found in this religious building. Ultimately, the origin of the key's name, as well as its entire existence, are shrouded in mystery. Lara resurfaces from her deep sea adventure with the Seraph in her possession and leaves the ocean behind. She is now ready to travel to Barkang Monastery in Tibet and use her newfound relic to unlock the door that is guarding the monastery's secret. Luckily for Lara, the water plane she arrived on is still parked in the rig's water gate. Marco Bartoli himself is still on the platform, probably waiting for his divers to emerge with the ancient salvage. Our adventurer hops on the plane and continues her journey to hunt down the dagger of Xi'an. Crossing the last bit of the Indian Ocean, and probably passing both India and Bangladesh before flying over the Himalayas, she finally arrives in the Tibetan highlands. Again, the game does not specify where exactly in Tibet Barkang Monastery is located. However, there is a high density of monasteries all across Tibet, especially in the foothills and Himalayan regions. Lara would likely have had to have made at least one fuel stop on her way from the ocean to the Tibetan plateau. However, it looks like she didn't put any more fuel in the plane because, upon arriving in Tibet and making it across the Himalayan mountain ranges, she runs out of fuel in midair. <laughs> After leaving the burning plane wreck behind in the mountains, our treasure hunter is forced to venture out on foot and makes her way up the rocky, snowy terrain to the monastery. Under the circumstances, Lara was lucky to have crash-landed where she did. It turns out that she isn't all that far from the remote grounds the Buddhist ascetics call home, and it's probably safe to assume there wasn't exactly a runway close by. Lara climbs through the cold foothills and, after trespassing on their territory, defends herself against an attacking snow leopard or two before she eventually has another run-in with Bartoli's men. The Fiamanera leader must have taken precautions and stationed his brutes around key locations like the monastery. She borrows one of the Fiamanera snowmobiles in order to cover more ground and races through the hills to reach the isolated monastery. It appears that the only way to get there effectively is through a cavernous passage deep inside the foothills. Lara is not the first to arrive there, as she discovers the monks engaged in a brutal fight with the Fiamanera attackers, a fight which Lara helps the monks to win. As she means them no harm, the monks welcome Lara into their home. It is possible that they might have watched her ascend the mountain and fight off the intruders, if they had had their time amidst their own battle. At no point does she reveal to any of them that the Seraph is in her possession, but the sudden ambush by the Italian cultists was probably a hint that someone amongst the visitors has the key with them. Lara walks through the halls in order to collect five Tibetan prayer wheels, also known as Mani wheels. These cylindrical wheels are very common in Buddhist traditions and are inscribed with mantras written in Sanskrit. For example, the popular Om Mane Padme Hum. Once collected, Lara must place them in their designated compartments on a wall where, mounted on a metal shaft so they can spin freely, they can be used for prayers. 
According to Tibetan Buddhist tradition, spinning a prayer wheel is said to have the same effect as orally reciting the prayers. However, in Lara's case, there is a much more secular function to these wheels, namely to open up the shrine that hides the passage to the monastery's catacombs, the passage that can only be unlocked with the seraph. As Lara sets out to collect the prayer wheels from the monastery's grounds, making her way through the beautifully decorated hallways and rooms, a variety of religious and mythological imagery can be seen. The aforementioned eyes of the Buddha, with their uncanny but coincidental resemblance to the seraph, can be found throughout the monastery, mostly painted on walls and pillars. The most prominent and most common symbol found in these halls is the so-called endless knot. This is one of the eight auspicious symbols which are considered the most meaningful symbols in Buddhism. The endless knot represents the recurring theme of unity and the interconnectedness of the universe. It is mostly featured in Tibetan Buddhism, but is also occasionally found in Chinese art. Another important motif in Buddhist art is the so-called Dharma wheel or Dharma Chakra, which roughly translates to Wheel of Law. It represents the teachings of the Buddha, as well as the endless cycle of samsara, or rebirth, which can only be escaped by following these teachings. In a time before personified depictions of the Buddha were common, the wheel was also used to directly represent him. On the monastery's rooftops, Lara comes across something that could very well be interpreted as a Dharma wheel. Even though it differs from the typical depictions, it still maintains the characteristic eight spokes and circular shape. With two golden deer statues on either side, the wheel is embedded into a gate that guards one of the five prayer wheels. These deer, in combination with the Dharma Chakra, can also be found decorating the entrance of Jokhang Monastery in Tibet's capital, Lhasa, which suggests that the wheel in Barkhang Monastery is in fact a Dharma wheel. The history of the real-life Jokhang Monastery dates back to the 7th century AD, but it is unclear just how old the fictional Barkhang Monastery might be. The monks who originally fought Chinese Emperor Qin Shu Huang in his dragon form, and who confiscated the dagger of Xi'an, might have been an independent group, which later formed the order that would become known as Barkhang. Buddhism only really arrived in Tibet 500 years into the Common Era, and half a millennia after the dragon emperor's defeat. Most Buddhist monasteries in Tibet were built between the 8th and the 17th centuries AD. Barkhang Monastery is probably no exception. A fascinating detail about the Dharma wheel in Barkhang Monastery is that it's covered in depictions of the seraph. Again, with its winged appearance and narrow shape, it looks just like the object that forms the actual key. However, this is not the only appearance of the seraph within Barkhang. It can also be spotted painted on doors and walls, which is further proof of just how integral the key is to the existence of this monastery. The most fascinating observation regarding the seraph can be found within a small shrine in one of the side chambers, which is also decorated with paintings of the key. This might be the original storage area for the seraph, which the monks failed to protect from thieves centuries ago. Back inside, and with the prayer wheels in her backpack, Lara visits the grand hall of the monastery. This features a gigantic statue of a deity which looks down upon the monks as they go about their daily routines. This architectural marvel might depict Avalokitesvara, also known as Chenrezig, an entity from the Tibetan Buddhist pantheon of enlightened beings, and which may very well be the most popular of all Buddhist divinities after the Buddha himself. The socket of the humongous statue is also Lara's next destination. A spacious pre-chamber beneath the statue also holds the compartments for the prayer wheels Lara has collected. Upon placing them in their rightful compartments, the prayer wheels trigger the mechanism that opens the gates to the inner sanctuary of Barkang Monastery. In its centre, a large circular golden plaque, with another carving of the seraph inside of a Tibetan knot pattern, watches whoever enters the chamber. A short ramp leads up to the middle of the wall, where there rests a mechanism for the fateful seraph to slot into. Upon inserting the seraph, some of the wooden beams supporting the ceiling of the stone chamber open up and reveal a passage and set of ancient stairs leading down into the cavernous catacombs of Barkang Monastery.
The catacombs of Barkang Monastery are a vast system of icy caves, passages, and rock formations. Parts of the cave have been converted into structures and rooms, while others, including glacial lakes and big chasms, were shaped organically by nature's forces and have remained untouched ever since. Lara makes her way through the catacombs and has to look through all the underground buildings to progress through the puzzle-ridden chambers. On her way deeper below ground, she stumbles across religious artifacts such as these ancient masks. Ritual masks like these were, and still are, used in spiritual dances in both Buddhist and Hindu tradition, where the wearers represent deities, saints, or other beings through their masks. The particular ones Lara finds may depict the wrathful divinity Mahakala, who is usually depicted as black in colour because of its reputation of absorbing absolutely everything and expressing the ultimate transcendence of all form. Although it is not known just how old the catacombs beneath Barkang Monastery are, it is very likely that they are much older than the building on top. After defeating the Dragon Emperor, the group of monks who would later form the Barkang Order took the dagger to its resting place in the Temple of Xi'an. However, to be safe, they removed part of the key mechanism of the door and took it with them, so that nobody could ever enter the temple and abuse the dagger's power again. The key to the door remained in their possession. When Buddhism became popular in Tibet, and the bloodline which dated back to the defeat of Qin Shu Huang constructed Barkang Monastery due to the religion's significance at the time, they may very well have built the monastery on top of the much older structure in the caverns beneath the mountain. Possibly, upon returning to their home in the foothills in the 3rd century BC, the warrior monks went about constructing sacred grounds where they could hide away the key to the Temple of Xi'an, and their descendants have inhabited the caves ever since. Apart from several endangered snow leopards, something else dwells in the underground structures. Something far more sinister. Almost human in appearance, but still closely resembling their earliest ape ancestors, these fearsome beasts have populated the halls beneath the monastery for centuries. These humanoid creatures have been labelled by many as a mere myth, but explorers have often tried to find substantive evidence for their existence, even though scientists continue to debunk them as rumours and stories. The famous South Tyrolean mountaineer and adventurer Reinhold Messner claimed to have encountered a yeti on one of his countless expeditions throughout the Himalayas. He even published a book entitled My Quest for the Yeti, in which he writes about his personal experiences regarding both the urban legend and the geographical region. Their harsh habitat in the cold caverns, which is otherwise only inhabited by fish, big cats, and perhaps Tibetan blue bears or Himalayan brown bears, suggests that the yetis are carnivorous creatures. Perhaps the yetis that other travelers have encountered in the Himalayas in the past could be traced back to the ones living in the caves beneath the monastery. Different words are used by a variety of Himalayan peoples to describe the yeti or similar legendary fauna. Some of these words can be translated to man-bear, wild man, or snowman. The word yeti itself comes from the Tibetan language and means something like bear from a rocky place, or more literally, rock animal. Perhaps the monks initially tried to capture these ape-like cryptids when they invaded their grounds, but were overwhelmed and eventually chose to relocate to the surface. As Lara descends ever deeper by staircases, ladders, rope bridges and chasms, passing more rooms and man-made structures, she eventually arrives at a giant ice cave far below ground. In the centre of the cave is a little shrine which would hypnotise any adventurer with its ancient beauty. Located on the ground, in the middle of the structure, is the age-old treasure the monks have protected for generations. This fateful artifact is none other than the fabled Talion, the most significant part of the mechanism that opens the ancient gate to the Temple of Xi'an, below the Great Wall. The Talion is a long and heavy cylindrical plug made from solid gold, with a handle attached and intriguing symbols carved into its body. These shapes correspond with the mechanism inside the temple's gate, in a similar way to how a key works. Turning the talion with its handle after inserting it into the gate's socket will activate the machinery and open the door.
Speaking of symbolism, another important icon can be seen inside the little structure that houses the Talion. This emblem plays a significant role in the history of the Dagger of Xi'an. Apart from within these catacombs, this symbol can also be seen on the entrance gate of the Temple of Xi'an. The Talion itself forms part of the design on the doors as the small dot within the circle. This design likely dates back to the time of Emperor Qin Xiu Huang and displays similarities to the ever-popular yin and yang symbol. The concept of yin-yang has been an integral part of Chinese philosophy for millennia, although it's changed its meaning and connotations throughout history. It generally describes a process of harmonization and the balance of all things, where each half of the symbol symbolizes an opposing cosmic force. Only if both sides are in balance can harmony be ensured. The differences between the Xi'an emblem compared to the yin-yang symbol can be seen in the minor details. One of the two dots that are usually present in each half is missing. A horizontal line runs through the image, and the line that separates both forces has extended beyond the boundaries of the circular shape surrounding both halves. This extension very clearly symbolizes a dragon, with one end representing its head and the other its tail. It is clear that this symbol is meant to represent the duality between black and white, good and evil, chaos and order, and in this specific case, human mortality and the immortality of the dragon. The Talion therefore not only unlocks the physical door to the temple, it also metaphorically unlocks the secret of immortality in the form of the power of the dragon. This fateful symbol was copied and adopted by the Fiemenera as their official logo. Perhaps this imposing design is what made Gianni Bartoli research the myth of the dagger, fueling his obsession in the first place and setting his heart on obtaining the ritualistic weapon. Regarding the Talion's name, it is once again very likely that we can trace it back to an error in translation or just an unfortunate choice of name. This is because the word itself is of Romance origin and has never been mentioned or adopted by any Asian cultures or myths. Before Lara can get her hands on what the Italians have been seeking and what the monks have been guarding for centuries, she has to first gain access to the building. She decides to use a gigantic ancient gong on top of it to break the walls of ice that have claimed the old structure. The frozen gong depicts an ominous-looking human-bird hybrid with snow leopard pelts tied around its waist. It is difficult to make out because of the washed-out colours, but it also seems to be holding a giant red snake in its hands and feet, which is also meandering around the gong. Corresponding with the aforementioned myth of the divine Garuda bird and its arch enemies, the Naga serpent race, this could very well depict a Garuda in a fight with a Naga snake. In relation to the Dagger of Xi'an, perhaps the red snake is meant to represent the dragon itself. In Chinese mythology, dragons are typically depicted as long, thin, serpent-like beings. This could mean that the bird creature has fought or is meant to fight the dragon and protect the power of the dagger from anyone who seeks to abuse it. As Lara opens up the formerly frozen structure and picks up the ancient Talion, something massive bursts through a nearby wall and heads her way. Lara defeats the possible Garuda and takes the object of her desire with her. The appearance of the supernatural creature, which turns out to be not so supernatural that it can withstand Lara's grenade launcher, delivers substantive evidence for a mythical force protecting the Talion. Now, Lara can finally return to the entrance to the Temple of Xi'an and unlock it. No more obstacles now stand between her and the dagger. Upon exiting the caves, Lara stumbles right into one of Bartoli's camps in the foothills. She continues her tradition of exclusively travelling with Fiamanera vehicles by stealing a jeep from right under their noses. Hey, hey. Ah.
After an exhausting journey, Lara finally returns to the Temple of Xi'an, beneath the previously visited portion of the Great Wall of China. She has the missing puzzle piece in her possession and can successfully set foot in the ancient sanctuary. These halls were last accessed over 2,000 years ago when the monks brought the powerful dagger back to its resting place. A dark but lushly decorated corridor leads Lara to a big hall with a red pedestal in its center. And there it is. Upon the pedestal lies the mythical dagger of Xi'an, waiting to be picked up. Located directly on the ceiling above it is another giant painting of the altered yin-yang symbol, this time with more traditional colors. Approaching the blade and captivated by its aura, Lara fails to notice that the sanctuary is littered with traps. giant waterfall flows directly beneath the dagger platform and forms an underground river and lake. The currents carry Lara directly to the shores of the small lake and she washes up in front of an imposing roofed gateway. The massive underground caverns reveal a deeper and more extensive window onto the history of the temple. It is clear that the temple is far more than just a place of concealment for the dagger. It is very likely that the entirety of the underground caverns forms the temple, and that this merely marks the entrance to another part of it. The gateway itself is a giant historical inaccuracy, as it looks to be based mostly on Ming and Qing dynasty architecture, which dates back to the mid and late second millennium AD. Even if the entrance is meant to represent an older architectural style, there is no way it can be classed as anything from before the common era, or even the Qing dynasty itself, that the buildings should date to. Due to their structures being largely built out of timber, not a lot of ancient Chinese architecture has withstood the test of time. There is very little remaining of the Han and Qing dynasties, except for walls and tombs. However, it is clear that early Chinese architecture was in no way as detailed or filigreed as this cavern gateway, or what lies beyond. The Luoyang Ancient Tombs Museum in Luoyang, China, offers a more profound look at the earlier dynasties of Chinese rule, including the Han Dynasty. Exhibitions of the respective tomb finds show that these earlier designs were already heavy with ornamentation, carvings and patterns, but much less so than those of the later medieval dynasties. This alleged historical error i.e. the design of the fictional Temple of Xi'an, could be explained if more recent Chinese dynasties used the space surrounding the dagger long after the Qing dynasty. This would raise the question of how they were able to enter the temple grounds without the talion in their possession. That being said, perhaps the Barkang monks are not actually related to those who defeated Emperor Qin Shi Huang. Maybe they took the talion with them at some point during the Common Era, there is no substantive evidence for or against this argument. If it were true, however, it would raise several questions. How did the monks find out about the dagger? Why was it so important to them that they set out to steal the talion and hide it away in their monastery's catacombs? And how did they get away with it despite the Chinese military no doubt guarding the temple? The more likely explanation is that the design of the temple was based on the wrong epochs of Chinese history due to a blurry perception of the historic circumstances. Inside the building, more art from various art and architectural periods can be found, including wall paintings, decorations and ceilings. Apart from the overall shades of red, yellow and gold that have always been the most popular colour choice in Chinese temples and palaces, and the extensive use of wood, some other particular details strike the eye. The most common theme that runs throughout the entire temple's design 
is the depiction of a mighty Chinese dragon, obviously related to the power of the dagger. This motif appears countless times and varies greatly in size, shape, colour and overall design. Another much more fascinating part of the temple's inner sanctuary is the existence of the variety of terracotta soldiers. Not only are these a spectacular find on their own, they also happen to be in close proximity to the actual tomb of Emperor Qin Xu Huang that was mentioned initially. The terracotta army is one of the most important archaeological finds of all time. The army itself is an accumulation of life-size sculptures depicting over 8,000 of the Emperor's soldiers and dates back to the 3rd century BCE. The figures were found accidentally in 1974 by local farmers from Xi'an. In the process, they also uncovered the gigantic necropolis surrounding the actual tomb of Qin Xu Huang. To this day, the tomb itself has still not been excavated because of an ongoing debate between archaeologists, historians and the public about whether it is safe to open or not with current technology. The layout and interior of the Emperor's tomb was described by the ancient Chinese historian Sima Qian of the Han Dynasty. He is considered the father of Chinese historiography for continuing and finishing the so-called Records of the Grand Historian that his father, Sima Tan, started writing before him. Chapter 6 of his Records of the Grand Historian, which contain the biography of Qin Xu Huang, reads, In the ninth month, the first emperor was interred at Mount Li. When the first emperor first came to the throne, the digging and preparation work began at Mount Li. Later, when he had unified his empire, 700,000 men were sent there from all over his empire. They dug through three layers of groundwater and poured in bronze for the outer coffin. Palaces and scenic towers for a hundred officials were constructed and the tomb was filled with rare artifacts and wonderful treasure. Craftsmen were ordered to make crossbows and arrows, primed to shoot at anyone who entered the tomb. Mercury was used to simulate the hundred rivers, the Yangtze and Yellow River, and the Great Sea, and set to flow mechanically. Above were representations of the heavenly constellations, below the features of the land. Candles were made from the fat of manfish, which is calculated to burn and not extinguish for a long time. The second emperor said, it would be inappropriate for the concubines of the late emperor, who have no sons, to be let out free. And he ordered that they should accompany the dead, and a great many died. After the burial, it was suggested that it would be a serious breach if the craftsmen who constructed the mechanical devices and knew of its treasures were to divulge those secrets. Therefore, after the funeral ceremonies had been completed and the treasures hidden away, the inner passageway was blocked and the outer gate lowered, immediately trapping all the workers and craftsmen inside. None could escape. Trees and vegetation were then planted on the tomb mound, such that it would resemble a hill. Sima Qian's mention of the Emperor's workers digging through three layers of groundwater and using mercury to simulate rivers could very well correspond with the actual scenery that Lara comes across inside the caverns. She also encounters a variety of ancient traps, including blades, spikes, trapdoors, boulders and, interestingly enough, sharp little discs shooting out of contraptions built into various walls. These seem to be similar to, and inspired by, the crossbows that the craftsmen were ordered to construct, which would shoot at anyone who triggered trip wires or pressure plates. One might think the traps would have stopped working after being exposed to the elements for over two millennia. However, Chinese historian Goa Zhiquen argues that they were built to last, using chrome as a protective material. No archaeological evidence of crossbows, or any other traps, has ever been found, and the only proven danger for anyone working the site is the toxic quantities of mercury within the tomb that was mentioned alongside the traps in Sima Qian's literary work. 
The existence of additional terracotta soldiers inside the Temple of Xi'an are further proof that these structures actually date back to the first emperor of China and are in fact a part of the huge necropolis surrounding his tomb. Lara traverses the treacherous, trap-filled sanctuary with the aim of making her way back up to the entrance hall where the dagger awaits her. Having arrived in the depths of the temple, her only way to ascend back to the top is via a long ladder. The ladder is surrounded by canals and pits filled with an ominous red liquid. This liquid may very well be the mercury mentioned in the records of the Grand Historian. It flows through and pools in various parts of the temple, suggesting that the builders of the necropolis really did use the chemical substance as a method of decorating the place, protecting it, or both. A large quantity of quicksilver has been measured within the unopened real-life tomb of Qin Xu Huang, and it is likely that the substance Lara encounters might be the same substance. The one odd thing about the liquid is that it is red instead of its usual characteristic silver colour. While there are myths about red mercury, the substance is considered to be a hoax. It has even been rumoured that it was used in the creation of nuclear bombs and other mysterious weapon systems. Our treasure hunter eventually returns to the top of the temple, only to discover that she's too late. The Fiamanera cultists have already arrived and claimed the dagger. After an eerie ceremony, which the Italian cult must have rehearsed in the past, Lara follows them through an impressive jade gateway that is otherwise completely shrouded in darkness, making it hard to see through. What she steps into is beyond human understanding. An area made up of floating palaces and other architectural elements made of jade Rocky terrain, beautiful vegetation, and ancient warriors turned to jade awaits our adventurer. The jade gateway she stepped through has closed behind her, and she has seemingly been separated from anything related to the temple. Apart from the almost random structures hovering in the atmosphere, her surroundings are pitch black and virtually endless. It is almost as if Lara has entered an isolated, supernatural realm, one in which time has come to a halt, and space does not exist. The most prevalent attribute of this transcendent plane is the use of jade. The processing of jade in Chinese culture has an extensive history. The rock had already been in use in Neolithic times, and was believed to be a medium between the mortal world and the heavenly sphere. It has since been associated with purity, grandeur, and beauty, as well as with the light male-yang side of the yin-yang duality. Furthermore, the so-called Jade Emperor, or Heavenly Grandfather, is one of the most influential figures in Chinese mythology, and is also one of the representations of the Chinese first god, who resides in and rules over heaven. On a more prosaic level, it is entirely possible that Lara has fallen victim to the dangerous and intoxicating red mercury that had been perhaps enriched with special hallucinogens. All of the objects and scenery that our adventurer encounters are present in the temple, so she might be hallucinating and making up her own version of the place. The pits filled with mercury have turned into blazing rivers and walls of fire. The jade structures have turned into floating, disjointed fragments and the terracotta statues have turned into living, breathing jade soldiers. Whatever this otherworldly void that Lara followed the Italians into, or that her hallucinations have imagined, really is, it leads her straight to an enormous hall made entirely of jade and decorated with rich detail in the form of engravings and adornments. The hall is so massive, it is hard to even see the other side of it. As our adventurer approaches what looks like an altar in its centre, she notices that Marco Bertoli is lying on top of the platform, with the dagger of Xi'an still stuck in his chest. 
What follows is the culmination of the epic journey of both of these opponents and the transformation of the obsessed cultist into a living, breathing dragon. After Bertoli mutated under these death-defying circumstances, it becomes clear why this Jade Hall is as spacious as it is. This suggests that it was built solely for the purpose of using the dagger, thus turning a person into the Chinese dragon. The slender yet heavy yellow serpent resembles the creature from Chinese mythology and is the exact same personified image that can be seen all over the temple. The power of the dagger is beyond scientific understanding and would make any scientist question his worldview. A fascinating speculation about the blade is that it might work in the same way as the Atlantean Skion. This ancient device, recovered by Lara on a previous adventure, had the peculiar capability to store knowledge and alter DNA. Although it worked in an eerily similar way to modern-day computers, it was constructed by the fictional race of Atlanteans long before any real-life advanced civilizations existed. Perhaps the Dagger of Xi'an is as old as this ancient people and was created using the same kind of technology until the Chinese got their hands on it several millennia later. Lara's final battle against the ginormous monstrosity undoubtedly takes place in the realm of these floating islands. If the theory about her hallucinations is taken into consideration, this would mean that the fight is actually made up and merely a figment of Lara's imagination. In reality, Lara may only be confronting a human Bartoli in these halls after he had taken the dagger from right under her nose. But under the influence of the hallucinogens from the temple, she becomes unable to separate reality from fiction. However, if the supernatural take on this battle is to be believed, then these halls Indeed, this entire realm could act as a space and timeless chamber in which the soul of the dragon kept within the Dagger of Xi'an can be freed and fused with the soul of a mortal. That scenario would raise the question of how the miraculous creature could ever actually leave this world and return to that of the mortals, which is evidently what happened when Emperor Qin Xu Huang used the dagger's power to defeat his enemies in battle. Either way, our heroine beats the villain, and after she pulls the dagger out of its scaly corpse, the dragon decays right there and then, leaving only its skeleton intact. The Great Hall collapses, and Lara must escape via the tunnels she came from, somehow making her way back to a world without floating rocks and living soldiers made of jade, only to emerge near the part of the Great Wall where she started this adventure. Whether Lara Croft fought and defeated a crazed cultist in a race for an ancient dagger, or single-handedly killed a mythological dragon in another worldly universe, there are bound to be different versions of this tale. In the end, there is always some truth to every story. After her epic trip around the world, Lara arrives back home at Croft Manor in Surrey, England. This estate has been in her family for generations. Lara inherited it from her great aunt after being disowned by her parents for her unconventional lifestyle choices. Likely built in the 15th century manor house style, complete with moat and gatehouse, vast gardens and training grounds, Croft Manor is Lara's place of business when she isn't busy travelling. Our adventurer is getting ready to enjoy a relaxing evening and can finally rest. Or so she thinks. While sitting on her bed and dressed in a luxurious blue bathrobe, she takes her time to admire her latest possession. All of a sudden, her security system goes off and the sound of alarm bells starts ringing throughout the mansion. Survivors of the Fiamanera have tracked our treasure hunter down and are out for revenge. Bartoli certainly gathered a huge following of cultists throughout the years, and his supporters insist on avenging their leader, and know of no boundaries to stop them. Unfortunately, they have not yet understood who they're dealing with. 
They might have missed the memo about Lara Croft wiping out their entire clan and defeating a dragon on top of all that. Our globe-trotting adventuress takes care of the intruders and leaves the bodies scattered throughout her estate for her butler, Winston, to clean up later. Finally, she can actually lie back and enjoy a well-deserved shower. But not before breaking one last thing in the course of this destructive adventure, the fourth wall. Don't you think you've seen enough? A woodin, a woodin, a woodin. <laughs> Feel free if I get this wrong to just take them out and um, compile them into some sort of blooper reel. I don't mind. I don't care. I've got no ego. This cultural building was once used by Bija, Babaji, Babadu, yeah, Babada. Uh, mm, yes. Try again. The convenient exit door. Ah, tick door. Try again. And another cultist, cultist by the name of Ills. Now let's try that again after the Fiamanera located the shipwreck. And I'm gonna to have to say that one again, because <laughs> I ran out of breath halfway through. One day, Gianni Martoli. Martoli? No, this isn't a pasta dish, this is Bartoli. Gianni Bartoli. Okay, Jenny, so stop pissing around, just get on with it. This artificial walkway, walkway? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see them walk on that. Jesus Christ, quite literally. Some rooms are completely accessible and not flooded. Although a ride a ride array, a ride away. No, let's try again. <clears throat> Lara makes her way through the catacombs and has to look through all the underground buildings in order to progress. Progress? Yeah, in order to procrastinate, I think. Let's try again. Some of these words can be translated to man bear, wild man, or snowman. Not the one with the carrots and pieces of coal and a scarf, you know. That's just cute and cuddly, but yet it's... Yeah. Oh, I've got a very itchy nose doing this, you know. This is... Don't know why, it's not hay for season. <laughs> These halls were last accessed over 2,000 years ago when the monks brought the powerful bagger Dak to it. Dak to it, Dak ding Dak. Dak da da. Try again. The second emperor said, it would be inopportune. Yeah, it would be an opportunity. It would be entirely appropriate if I could actually say the damn thing. Let's try again. A fascinating speculation about the blade is that it might work in the exact same way as the as the Fathian <laughs> I've got Atlantean scene and fascinating speculation mixed up. Try again. <laughs> <laughs> 